good evening, everyone. Welcome and thanks for coming. I'm John Hinderocker, president of Center of the American Experiment. Thank you. And our, uh, our program this evening is on the environmental catastrophe of green energy. We have two speakers tonight. The first is Isaac Orr. Isaac is a policy fellow specializing in energy and the environment and natural resources at Center of the American Experiment. He is the author of the 2019 paper, Doubling Down on Failure, which won the national award that year as the most influential research published by anyone in 2019. And it's, it's an unbelievable piece of work. And there are four or five states that have reached out to Isaac and said, can you help us take your model and apply it to our state. And Isaac and his colleagues have worked with several states on doing that. It's a great piece of work. And we have a bunch of copies at the desk out here. So you can pick one up on your, uh, on your way out the door. Our second speaker is Robert Bryce. Uh, Robert is one of the uh, top in the United States in the field of energy. He's written six books, most, most recently a book called A Question of Power. And Robert produced a documentary film called Juice, How Electricity Explains the World. He went all around the world uh, to produce this documentary. It's terrific. You can find it on Hulu and YouTube and a variety of streaming services. And I highly recommend it. It's really very good. And Robert wrote this paper. It's called Not in Our Backyard. He wrote this for Center of the American Experiment. It's brand new. And this, too, we have copies of on the, uh, on the table uh, as you leave. So if you want to pick up that paper as well, I, uh, I highly recommend it. So our format tonight is that both Isaac and Robert will talk for 20 or 25 minutes. And then we'll have a few minutes at the end for questions and answers. So at this point, please welcome Isaac Orr. All right, everybody. All right, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. This is a great crowd. It's good to see so many smiling faces. Uh, my name is Isaac Orr. I'm a policy fellow specializing in energy and environmental policy at Center of the American Experiment. Uh, and I guess for my big disclaimer, I grew up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin, so get your booze out now. <laughs> All right, great. <clears throat> Yeah, so the title of my talk is The Environmental Catastrophe of Wind and Solar Power. And really, uh, the point of the talk is, or the point of that title is to get people thinking about the fact that all energy sources have environmental impacts, whether that is a coal plant, a natural gas plant, a nuclear plant, or wind and solar power. We tend to think of wind and solar as a consequence-free uh, source of energy, but that's just not how anything works. Everything that we do as humans has an impact on the environment, whether that's mining or tourism. I mean, that's one of the ways that invasive species get spread easiest, right? So we want to make sure that we're having an informed conversation about the environmental impacts of wind and solar so we can have the best, most reliable, and most environmentally friendly uh, electric grid possible. <clears throat> so uh, we're going to talk about these uh, negative environmental impacts. So how can renewables be bad for the environment? There are a few different ways. Uh, wind and solar require a lot more metal than other types of electricity generators. And uh, we'll look at how much metal it would actually take in order to go uh, with a Minnesota Green New Deal, if you will. Uh, and where we mine matters, uh, that has a huge impact on the environmental impact of um, mining. Uh, where we manufacture matters. Uh, decommissioning, uh, we'll see that uh, wind and solar are uh, not as sturdy as other sources of energy. And it also has an impact on global temperatures. So we want to talk about that as well. Uh, so metal requirements, uh, wind and solar are renewable and infinite resources, but the metal that you need in order to harvest that energy and put it to useful work for humans are not, uh, they are actually finite, they are not inexhaustible. So we need to be looking at this from a, is there enough copper, nickel, and cobalt around in order to harness these renewable energies? So uh, these metals have to be mined, refined, and turned into usable products. And the graphic above is from the International Energy Agency. And it shows that an electric car takes way more metal than a conventional car. Uh, offshore wind is a huge metals hog. Uh, but uh, even onshore wind and solar require more metal than a nuclear power plant, a natural gas power plant, or a coal plant. So if we wanted to say, for instance, OK, let's do a Minnesota Green New Deal. What does that look like? That small bar at the bottom is how many power plants we have in operation right now. It's about 17,000 uh, megawatts. 
a big coal plant is about 1,000 megawatts. So just think of that as 17 coal plants, right? So Excel Energy modeled to see how many wind turbines, solar panels, and battery storage facilities it would take to go 100% fossil fuel free, and they found that it would take about 21 coal plants, or 21,000 megawatts of uh, solar, about 15,000 megawatts of uh, wind, or 15 giant power plants, or I believe it was 24 uh, me thousand megawatts of battery storage. And because Excel Energy produces about half the electricity in the state of Minnesota, we doubled that. So rather than having what we have today, which is the equivalent of 17 uh, you know, coal-fired power plants, we would need 120 thousand megawatts of, uh, of wind, solar, and battery storage, and that will have a huge impact on the demand for metals, and you can see that from a global perspective. So you would need about 1% of the world's copper production on an annual basis to build a grid like that, 4% of the global nickel, 43% of the cobalt, and you know, thankfully for iron and steel, there's a lot more of that, but we also use it for a lot of other things. So. Uh, there are competing interests for these metals as well. But, you know, if you're going to, oh, that's the equivalent of 52,000 blue whales. It's about 7.9 million tons of material. And that's more blue whales than exist. So um, <clears throat> that's not a great thing. Hopefully we can fix that someday. Um, but uh, that's only part of the story because the, the electricity that we use isn't all the energy that we use on a daily basis. In Minnesota, 35% of all the energy that we use is oil, and that's predominantly transportation fuels. That's gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, uh, and a lot of the, of the rest of it is natural gas that we use for home heating or for industrial processes. So if you were going to try and scale up and get rid of all those fossil fuels for the energy that we rely on for transportation and home heating, you would actually have to build a lot more wind turbines and solar panels than we talked about before, and that would require a lot more metal. So let's look at that. For, uh, to basically get rid of those fossil fuels, we would need to more than double the amount of copper, nickel, and cobalt that we uh, discussed in the, the last scenario. And if you want to convert Minnesota's 5 million uh, gasoline-powered cars to be electric, you're looking at needing 4% of the global copper, 18% of global nickel, and 164% of the global cobalt production that comes around on an annual basis. And the... Uh, I think it was Goldman Sachs had a report called Copper is the New Oil, and they said that only one million tons of copper are used for so-called green copper uses, so that's wind turbines, solar panels, or electric car, globally on an annual basis. So just getting one state, state of Minnesota, to be a you know, green new state uh, would require 71% of all the copper that's currently used for, for green purposes. So this is just an enormous quantity of metal. And when you think about this, uh, wind turbines only last for 20 years, electric car batteries only last for up to 20 years, and solar panels last 25 to 30 years. So you wouldn't even be able to replace all of these uh, systems, or you wouldn't even be able to decarbonize the entire United States before you'd have to go back and replace all of these wind turbines that are kind of temporary uh, electricity generators. And you know, where are we going to get all of this metal? And unfortunately, when it comes to cobalt, we get it from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, which is neither democratic nor a republic. Um, <laughs> and as many as 40,000 kids are working in cobalt mines, washing the hand, or digging the ore by hand, and washing it in rivers. So uh, there's a huge environmental and human impact to that. These are not MSHA approved. We don't have regulators going through and making sure that the levels of particulates in this mine are safe. Uh, so, you know, these kids are working in unsafe working conditions and it has a huge impact on the environment and their well being. So, uh, you'll, you guys will enjoy this. I Googled smug license plate and this is the first thing that came up was a Tesla that said, say no to gas or nay to gas, sorry. Um, but uh, because much of the mining is going to happen in the developing world, uh, because here's the, here's the other um, you know, irony of the situation. Minnesota has the largest undeveloped deposits of copper, nickel, and cobalt in the world. But the same groups that want us to go to this green new electric grid do not want to let us develop those resources, right? So they want it to happen somewhere else. And if it happens somewhere else, it's not going to have the same level of oversight and environmental protection. So we are essentially, the people who drink fair trade coffee don't seem to care about fair trade cobalt in their electric car batteries, and that's a problem. Uh, manufacturing? Oh, that's okay, you guys don't have to do that. 
just hold your applause, please. Uh, so uh, manufacturing matters too. 80% of the world's uh, solar panels come from China, and they have a very bad track record of producing these things in an environmentally responsible way. There were protests outside of the Jinko solar facility in 2011 because they were dumping the toxic waste into the rivers, killing wildlife and fish. And then there's also the problem that Chinese solar panels have that they're made in factories powered by coal-fired power plants. And uh, they're, uh, if you're in Western China, they're, they're using slavery. Uh, it's uh, been described as, or from the German government as a genocide of Muslim Uyghurs. It's ethnic minorities that are being enslaved to make solar panels. So, you know, there's, uh, there's the, you know, okay, they're burning coal, that's not great. If, you're, if your whole mission is to reduce emissions, you're, you're increasing them to make these, these solar panels. Why are we making our own grid more expensive, less reliable? Why don't we cut out the middleman, continue to use our existing coal-fired power plants until they don't run anymore? But I'm, that's a whole nother talk. We're not getting into that tonight. Uh, but let's talk about decommissioning. And this, this hits on that theme earlier. It's where wind turbines and solar panels go to die. Uh, compared to other types of power plants, wind and solar are temporary or disposable power plants, right? So a nuclear plant can run for 80 years. A natural gas or a coal plant can run for 60. So if you have to replace a wind turbine every 20 years or a solar panel every 30 years, you have an enormous waste stream that uh, is going to be uh, something that we need to consider from an environmental standpoint. And, you know, most of the material in the turbine itself is recyclable. You've got the steel, copper, and aluminum, but the blades aren't. They're fiberglass, they're plastic. I mean, those things are built to be indestructible, and unfortunately, when you go to tear them down, they're still indestructible. Um, so they end up in landfills, and, you know, when it comes to the concrete bases, they'll, they'll cut off the first four feet of the concrete and collector cable, but the rest of it stays underground forever. So, you know, concrete's inert, we have it everywhere, so it's not gonna be an environmental pollution problem, but it will present land use challenges in the future if you wanna, you know, build a house out in that area. So you have to be cognizant of that. Um, so uh, the amount of, you know, let's go back to that Green New Deal, right? When we were talking about how many uh, wind turbines we would need, the amount of plastic and fiberglass in those wind turbine blades would be the equivalent of 2.2 trillion plastic straws over 20 years, right? Uh, so when it comes to solar, solar panels are not recyclable. Uh, they used to be more recyclable, but in order to reduce costs, they reduce the amount of silver in the, the panel. So now it's much cheaper to send it to a landfill. It costs one to, one to $2 to landfill a solar panel. It costs $30, 20 to $30 to recycle one. So what do you think happens, right? Uh, so this is from the Harvard Business Review. This is a, a graph that shows that people are actually replacing their solar panels earlier than anticipated, and this is causing a looming, or a looming solar trash wave. So some quotes from that study. Uh, some governments may classify solar panels as hazardous waste due to the amount of heavy metals, cadmium, et cetera, uh, and research shows that pollutants such as lead and carcinog other carcinogens can almost completely be washed out of the fragmented solar modules over a period of several months by rainwater, which is naturally acidic. Uh, we see volumes of waste surpassing that of new installations by the year 2031. By 2035, discarded solar panels would outweigh new units by 2.6 times. So uh, we, have, we have a lot of things that we need to consider while we're making these energy decisions to make sure we're making informed decisions. And this is, this is the last uh, new thing that I'm gonna talk about, but it's an impact on global temperatures, or sorry, local temperatures, right? So we talk about the whole reason for building wind turbines and solar panels is to reduce emissions, therefore to hopefully reduce the future global temperature, right? But a study by Harvard University found wind turbines can cause localized warming that exceeds the amount of warming that they would potentially prevent in the future. And it does this because the, you know, hot air rises in the atmosphere, it cools down, and then it sinks back down. If you have a wind turbine operating, it's acting like a giant fan, like a ceiling fan mixing that air. So you actually have a situation where it's warming up the, the surface area where people live, where people farm. I mean, I've, I'm very sensitive to that. Uh, so the Harvard study said the direct impacts of wind power are instant, while the benefits of reduced emissions accumulate slowly. If your perspective is the next 10 years, wind power actually has, in some respects, more climate impact than coal or gas. If your perspective is the next 1,000 years, then wind power has enormously less climate impact. I don't know of a single coal plant that's lasted 1,000 years, so maybe we shouldn't put the cart before the horse. Um, so uh, the, this is just a, this shows that the amount of warming over a wind farm region up in that top orange dotted line 
is going to exceed the amount averted by that gray line down on the bottom. And just to give you a real practical example of this, um, we have the change in wind temperature. Uh, they actually take measure or temperature measurements at wind farms in Texas in order to ascertain whether the theory that the, the air mixing in the, in the atmospheric columns uh, is going to actually produce on the ground warming. And they found that at night it's a lot higher uh, just because uh, during the day the sun is causing convection in the air or the you know, temperature is changing a little bit more. But it would be about a 96 times greater impact at night for a global temperature than you could ever hope to emit or avert by getting rid of all the emissions in the state of Minnesota. So just everything that we do to create an emission in the state, get rid of it, and it would be 0.003 degrees C by 2100. Uh, but every single night you would have a situation where you would be increasing the temperature near that wind turbine by, boy, by about 0.29 degrees C. So if we're going to care about you know, the impact on agriculture, that's going to increase the evaporation rate a lot more than you know, reducing some future global temperature. So uh, a lot of the arguments that are made, as we see, uh, you know, it's not re really as beneficial to the environment as we've been led to believe. I mean, everything has an impact, right? So I, I don't want you to come away and think that only wind and solar have a negative environmental impact. It's all about how do you manage the environmental impact, right? How do you mitigate that to where the benefits of the energy source are commensurate with the cost? So um, the industries uh, spur a huge demand for metals that depend on supply chains that have little environmental or really human rights oversight. Uh, disposal of wind and solar panels and waste will present end of life challenges. And we're, wind turbines cause more localized warming. So we need to, so people who are really concerned about future global temperatures should really be supporting nuclear power because it's the only thing that's always on and it doesn't emit CO2. So uh, that's my soapbox. Uh, so we have Robert Bryce coming up. Let's give Robert a big round of applause. Thanks, Frank. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, sincere thanks to John Hinderocker um, for inviting me to write this report for the Center of the American Experiment. I have been following the wind industry for 10 years. They don't like me. I don't like them back. <laughs> First, I'm going to talk about Texas. Um, and I'm not here to brag about Texas. I'm born and raised in Oklahoma, so I'm not going to give you that everything's better in Texas. But my wife, Lauren, is here. We were blacked out for 45 hours beginning at 2 a.m. on February 15th. Now, talking about snow in Minnesota is probably not a good idea, talking, complaining about it. I live 1,200 miles south of here. And I know you all get a lot of snow, but to have six inches of snow on my roof for six days was unusual. These, this is a photo of my, the, the solar panel on our house in Austin. We live in central Austin. I have eight and a half kilowatts of solar panels on the roof of my house. Why do I have solar panels on the roof of my house? Because I got big fat subsidies to put them on there. That's why. So I'm opposed to energy subsidies unless I'm getting them. <laughs> but there's a really serious point here, and Ale uh, uh, Isaac made some very very trenchant remarks about the environmental impacts, but what has not been fully appreciated by the political class here in the United States is the human impacts of the, of the blackouts that occurred in Texas. As it was, the, the economic losses were estimated at $200 billion. The initial mortality estimates were around 200 people, most of whom froze to death, several dozen died of carbon monoxide poisoning. But a later estimate came up that put the figure at 700, and that was looking at excess mortality that occurred both during the storm and immediately after. So people who weren't necessarily killed by the immediate effects of the storm, but who missed their dialysis or other things that happened that, that ultimately killed them. 700 was the best estimate. But understand this, that the Texas grid, the ERCOT grid, serves about 25 million people. And it came within that much, that close to a complete system black. The head of ERCOT, Bill Magnus, had said on February 25th, I believe the date was, that the, the whole system was within four or five minutes of collapse. Now think about that. A state the size of Texas, a key provider of food, fuel, key transportation hub, 
suddenly it loses power, and it wouldn't have lost power for a day or two. It likely would have lost power for weeks. The, the, the mortality, the death toll, would have been measured in the tens or even hundreds of thousands. We would have lost control of the border. Our, uh, some of our biggest military installations wouldn't have had power for days or weeks on end. I mean, to me, it's, it's a stunning development because the electric grid is our most important network. And if it had gone down, and, and why did it happen? Because our political class didn't, uh, does not understand the nature of the electric grid. They didn't understand how important it is, and they said, well, we'll let the market solve this. Well, no, not on something this important. So I joke about the, 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 the solar panels on the roof of my house, but what is the key, what's, what's the oldest maxim in politics? Follow the money. Okay, so follow the money. I use screen grabs a lot in my PowerPoints, uh, and so you look at that with the $53 billion invested, that's a screen grab, a, a screenshot from poweringtexas.com, which is funded by the wind lobby. Right below that is a screenshot from the solar industry business saying how much they invested in Texas. So a little bit of math, and I did a short, a quick estimate for 2020. How much money was spent in Texas on wind and solar in the years before the blackouts? $66 billion. Why did they spend $66 billion? Because they got $22 billion in subsidies. Nearly all of the capacity that was built in Texas before the blackouts wasn't built for resilience or reliability. It was built to collect subsidies. The market has been entirely corrupted by the investment tax credit and the production tax credit. So what did that do? We saw a dramatic change between 2006 and 2020, the same time period, a roughly 20% increase in wind generation and a 20% decline in coal-fired generation. But why does that matter? Um, well, and, and uh, uh, finally, uh, just one more slide on follow the money. Okay, so why was so much wind and solar built in the state? It was because that's where the money is. So I created this slide. I'm, I'm sure I'm, you're, you're, these are going to be some of the homeliest PowerPoint slides you've ever seen, but nevertheless, they're mine. These are numbers that I collected from the, the Congressional Research Service on the total tax credits uh, uh, that were uh, uh, supplied by the federal government. I combined the tax credit data with BP data on the amount of energy produced in the United States and normalized it around exajoules. That's the dollars per exajoule. What's an exajoule? It's an SI unit. It's equal to about a quadrillion BTUs or one trillion cubic feet of natural gas. So it doesn't matter what the x-axis is, what the denominator is, whether it's, uh, you, we could put gallons of gasoline, we could put uh, BTUs, doesn't matter. The punchline here is that solar industry is getting 250 times more federal tax love than the nuclear sector. The wind energy business is getting 160 times more. So why are we building solar and wind? Follow the money. That's where the money is. And I'm in complete agreement with Isaac. If we're serious about climate change, if we're serious about reducing emissions, we have to get serious about nuclear. We are not serious about nuclear. Instead, in some of the most heavily democratic states in America, New York, Illinois, California, nuclear plants are being closed and it's being cheered on by some of the biggest environmental groups in America, including the Natural Resources Defense Council and the Sierra Club. This is deeply unfortunate because it is undermining the resilience and reliability of the grid. The closure of the Indian Point nuclear plant in Buchanan, New York in April of this year was a travesty. Even if you don't care about CO2 emissions, the fact that they are losing a reliable baseload form of generation close to the city of New York that was providing 25% of the electricity needed by a city of 8 million people from a footprint of one square kilometer, and they closed it down. Good riddance, Andrew Cuomo. You sorry bastard. He cheered it on in 2017, gleefully announced, we're going to close this plant. Well, bully for you. Don't let the door hit you in the ass. OK, sorry, I'm getting all wound up here and screwing up my slides. OK, wait a minute. There we are. Uh, Picasso said, uh, amateurs borrow professional steel. I stole this slide from Art Berman. After the blackouts in Texas, there were stories in the New York Times, Paul Krugman, Naomi Klein saying, oh, those crazy Republicans down in Texas blaming the renewables. Oh, they're so dumb. This slide shows why that is not true. Okay, I don't know if this has a laser pointer on here. I don't know. Anyway, oh, God, 
dog it, wait the heck. I need to get somebody else to run my slides here. Okay, so this is a, roughly a, a one-month period. You see the, where the word wind is. That's when the, where the weather is fair in Texas uh, on like January 30th. It backs out. Look how it backs out natural gas. This is the amount of generation in the ERCOT grid. Okay, so when the weather is great, yeah, sure, here's wind backing out natural gas. Well, what happened at 2.15, I'm, I'm sorry, on, on February 15th at about 2 a.m., when our lights went out in Austin and stayed off for 45 hours, where's wind and solar? They went to Cancun with Ted Cruz. <laughs> Not here, gone. What came into the grid? Lots of natural gas. And yet the, envi the, the environmental groups, the, the, the climate activists said, oh, it's the natural gas business. They're a problem. They didn't show up. They didn't show up. This graph shows exactly the opposite. Did some gas go missing? Yes, it did. What was the problem? And the lack of coordination between the electric regulators and the natural gas regulators. Some of the pipelines froze. Some of the, some of the gas processing plants and pipelines were cut off from the electric grid mismanagement, uh, th th there are a lot of reasons why the blackout failed. But it wasn't because of natural gas. It was because in, in, in the years before the blackouts, all the money that was spent on capacity in Texas was spent on weather-dependent renewables. And when it came to crunch time, they left. They were nowhere to be found. And here's the problem. It, now, in the, in the next two years, the only capacity that will be added in the ERCOT grid is solar and wind. Why? Because of the slide I showed you earlier, this one uh, right here, right? Why, why would they build anything else? There are 35 gigawatts, 35,000 megawatts of new capacity that will be added to the Texas grid over the next two years. 24 gigawatts of solar and 11 gigawatts of wind. Why would an investor build anything else? Why are we having power shortages in June? Well, this is, again, this is exactly almost four months to the day after Lauren and I lost power. If you, this is a screen grab from ERCOT. That is, Jan, that is June 15th. Look at the peak demand is the black line. The green line is showing the actual integrated wind output. You can go to the ERCOT website under their wind integration reports section, and you can pull this very data down. They were predicting uh, power shortages today in Texas because it's hot. The wind doesn't blow when it's hot. And so when power demand peaks, even on hot days, and I showed you on earlier on cold days, wind goes on vacation. They're not required to provide power when power is dear. And that is corrupting the market. OK, so let me uh, zoom out and talk about the Biden administration. And I'm going to just preface it by saying, I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I'm just disgusted. No, that's, that's not an applause line. But look at what we've heard over and over, the energy efficiency and clean energy standard. The Biden administration said repeatedly, we're going to back out all wind and, and uh, we're going to back out all coal and natural gas. OK, well, show me the math. Here's the math. Again, a slide that I produced. The, the, uh, the, the line second from the bottom is, is coal and natural gas. That's how much electricity we generate every year, about 2,700 terawatt hours. Well, some of the best advice I got in my career when presenting information, presenting numbers, was from Edward Tufte. He said, whenever you give people a number, Give, it some, give people something to compare it to, a metric that they're familiar with so that they know what the scale is. So what's 2,700 terawatt hours? It's roughly equal to the output of every nuclear reactor on this planet. It's 27 times the output of every solar panel in America, including the heavily subsidized ones I have on the roof of my house. This idea that we're going to do this and we're going to do it in 14 years, remember the promise is by 2035, Call me a skeptic. <laughs> Jennifer Granholm, all due respect to the former governor of Michigan, I don't see any uh, uh, pump jacks on her. This is a screen grab from her Twitter page. I don't see any pump jacks up there. I don't see any coal mines. I don't see any cooling towers from nuclear power plants. I see solar panels and wind turbines. And on March 3rd, in a speech, arguably at that time the most important speech she had given in her career, and the most, certainly the most important one as energy secretary, she said, we have to add hundreds of gigawatts to the grid over the next four years. Madam Secretary, <laughs> if you please, the entire grid in the United States is about 1,000 gigawatts, one terawatt. It's actually about 1.2 terawatts, 1,200 gigawatts. 
Either she doesn't understand what a gigawatt is, or she's assuming that we can build this much capacity and do it with just a, a little bit of the waving of the hands. I knew the Biden administration was going to be extreme. I had no idea it was going to be this extreme. Or that their level, frankly, of, I have to say what it is, frankly, of the ignorance of the leadership and the, and the, the, the extreme rhetoric that they're using leaves me gobsmacked, truly. Okay, so what about friction in, in the wind energy business? And it was one of the reasons why I came to John uh, uh, several months ago to write this report was because Minnesota has been one of the hottest states for the backlash against the wind business. And Christy Rosenquist is here, one of the people who's been fighting the wind business in this state and freeborn wind. But other people, rural Americans, saying we don't want this crap in our neighborhoods. And it's not just Minnesota, it's from Norway to Nebraska. These are all uh, screenshots, San Bernardino County, California, the largest county by area in America, banned large-scale renewable projects. San Bernardino County, California, where they have a 100% clean electricity mandate by 20, 20, 2045. Oh, and they're closing Diablo Canyon, their only remaining nuclear plant that provides 10% of the state's electricity. Solar is being rejected as well. This is the next big battleground. All of these clips, except for the uh, one from Cambria, that's Cambria, New York, they rejected a big solar project. Uh, the, the, the headline there on the top, the, the field north of Vegas, that was just a few weeks ago. It was an 800 megawatt uh, solar project that would have covered 14 square miles. And the locals said, we don't want this here. Uh, the, the project in Butte, Montana is more recent, the one in uh, the township in Pennsylvania. These projects create solar deserts, no plants, no wildlife, and people that are, have, are, has, are facing the prospect of having these projects built near them are saying, no, thank you, go somewhere else. So fundamentally, whenever you build anything, there's a land use consequence. And what is the fundamental problem with wind and solar? It's basic physics. I mentioned the, the Indian Point nuclear plant in New York. The power density of that nuclear plant, which is now shuttered, it's a travesty that it was closed. 2,000 watts per square meter. That's the power density. What's power density? It's a measure of energy flow you can get from a given area, volume, or mass. 2,000 watts per square meter is the power density at Indian Point. The power density of wind energy, I don't care where you put it, is one watt per square meter. The power density of solar, I don't care where you put it, is 10 watts per square meter. We're talking three orders of magnitude, or two orders of magnitude. These are enormous differences. And that basic physics metric is the, is the key to understanding the land use conflicts that are underway. OK, so I'm going to get wound up again here and go all Jimmy Swaggered on you, maybe, or Joel Osteen or somebody. But nevertheless, <laughs> you know, I, I, I have a long and checkered academic career. I got my degree, BFA, from the University of Texas, a bunch of PhDs from Princeton produced this, this report. It's a screenshot of the, the uh, amount of transmission capacity that would be required in an all-renewable scheme in the United States. Look at the amount of interstate high-voltage transmission that they are claiming can be done. And then I highlighted there in the, in the yellow and the green, they're saying, well, we'll just triple the amount of high-voltage transmission capacity in the United States. Oh, and we'll do this by 2050. Oh, really? Well, I don't have a PhD, but I can look up the fact that in the last 10 years or so, there's been effectively zero miles of high voltage interstate transmission built in this country. In 2017, the state of Iowa passed a, 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 a ban on, the law was signed into, a bill was signed into law by the governor, banning the use of, high, of eminent domain for high voltage transmission. A few weeks ago in the state of Missouri, the Missouri House passed a similar measure. It didn't pass the Senate, wasn't signed into law. The state of Arkansas, the entire congressional delegation was opposed to a high voltage transmission project called the Plains and Eastern Line. Killed that project. If you think building a pipeline three or four or five feet under the ground is hard, try putting it 200 feet up in the air. And yet this, this, this proposal, this scheme, this model, produced by Princeton University, was covered in the New York Times, who called it something like uh, daunting but doable. It was covered in The Economist, you know, oh yeah, yeah, la, la, la. Where are the, the scientists who look at first principles? Where are you going to put it? How are you going to connect it? And how are you going to pay for it? Nothing. They didn't look. Oh, well, the model says we can do it. Must be possible. 
Okay, so back to power density. If you imagine the amount of electricity we consume in the United States, about 4,000 terawatt hours per year, four petawatt hours, how much land would be required if we just tried to generate it all with electricity? And this is uh, with wind energy, forgive me. So forget, as, Eric, uh, as, as Isaac did talk about transportation demand, forget about transportation and industrial man demand, just existing uh, and trying to electrify all that demand, just the existing electricity demand. What would it require if we tried to meet it all with wind turbines? It would require a land area of 900,000 square kilometers, a land area twice the size of the state of California. Well, that's kind of coincidental, isn't it? Because you cannot build wind turbines in California. A state that you know, claims that, oh, we're going all renewable, we, you know, we love our quinoa and our yoga pants, blah, 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 blah. They're all moving to Austin, by the way, and they brought the blackouts with them. <laughs> so these aren't my numbers. You can see the references there, Václav Smil. Uh, uh, Isaac quoted some work by David Keith. He's a, uh, a professor at Harvard. He, he came up with the same numbers eight years after Václav Smil's calculations. These are daunting numbers. Oh, well, we'll just put it out there, you know, and fly over country, like in maybe Freeborn County or, you know, in Iowa or in Oklahoma, you know, we'll put it out there in Hickville. Well, those people out there don't want your damn wind turbines. Okay, so this is data. This is what uh, John and I talked about months ago. I've been collecting this data for, since 2015, looking at, at, at media uh, reports, small town newspapers, small town uh, television stations, not the New York Times, <laughs> collecting data on every municipality, every county, every state that has, passed, has rejected or restricted wind projects. The, num the total number today is 300, no, it's 313. Some of the biggest, the, the most uh, strident backlash against the wind business has occurred in New York State, one of the most heavily democratic states in the country. It's happening all across the country. It's happening all around the world. People are looking at wind turbines and saying, no, thank you. We don't want those 600-foot high wind turbines in our backyard. Um, by the way, the, the database is on the American uh, Experiment website. You can look at it yourself. There are URLs leading you to all the the articles that are referenced that show what the, what the name of the project is, the county, and the government entity. Um, this is a photo from the Honolulu Star Advertiser from November of 2019. How many of you have heard about the, the arrest that happened at the Dakota Access Pipeline? Go ahead, raise your hand. Keystone XL? How many, keep your hand up if you know there were 200 people arrested on the island of Oahu in late 2019 protesting a wind project? Out of a crowd of maybe 215, three hands are up doesn't fit the narrative. 200 people arrested near the village of Kahuku protesting a wind project. Go on Facebook and just plug in Kahuku. People were duct taping themselves together and lying in the middle of the road to block this wind project. It got built anyway. I was in Columbus, Ohio, talking to the Ohio Electric Cooperative Association earlier this week, and they pointed out this bill that passed there. And I'll only bring it up and just briefly, SB 52, signed into law by Governor DeWine uh, last month, the bill gives local counties control over what's built in their counties, including renewable projects. Not a single Democratic voter or a Democratic legislator voted in favor. What does that tell you? It's that I, I, I have to say, it, and I'll say it as clearly as I can the Democratic Party and the Sierra Club, I repeat myself. The Democratic and the par uh, party, does not, they're not interested in cutting emissions, they're interested in building renewables, and it's not the same thing. Not a single Democratic legislature in, a legislator in the Ohio legislature voted in favor of local control. What does that tell you? It tells you that they don't favor land rights, they don't favor property rights, and they think, well, whatever it is, we're just going to put it out there in Trump, Trump land and, you know, screw those people. That's how I read it. This is a contentious issue. I've been following the issue of, of wind turbine noise and human health for more than a decade. The science is clear. Not everyone is affected the same by infrasound and low frequency noise, but it is a problem. It causes sleeplessness and it harms human health. And the wind industry has brazened it out for years. So, oh, well, that's no more sound than a refrigerator. Doesn't matter. You know, all oh, these people are just whiners. They're complainers. Well, then why did they buy out people here in Minnesota after years of them complaining about noise from wind turbines. And I was pleased to do this report because it led me to discover that the Minnesota Department of Health talked about this in 2009. 
the scientific research on this is clear, and it's more than a decade old, and it continues to be ignored in favor of these uh, putting up more renewable capacity, sacrificing human health in the process. It's unconscionable what is happening. I'm a bird watcher. I love birds. I've, Lauren and I have traveled a fair part of the world looking at birds. I highlight the, the, the headline at the top. That's from an article that I wrote for the Christian Science Monitor in 1990. I've been in the journalism business for a while, never had a real job. I wrote about it back then because there was a, uh, some massive mortality was happening in the oil pits and oil fields in Oklahoma, Texas, Louisiana, New Mexico, and the Fish and Wildlife Service Division of Law Enforcement engaged in a multi-state, multi-jurisdictional crackdown, brought more than 200 cases against oil and gas companies for having unnetted oil pits. Birds were landing in them and dying. The estimate at that time was 500,000 birds a year were being killed by open oil pits. Today, the Fish and Wildlife Service and other biologists estimate 500,000 birds, including not just passerine birds, not perching birds, raptors, and some of our most iconic raptors, golden eagles, bald eagles, hawks. The tally is roughly 500,000 birds a year. 30 years ago, the Fish and Wildlife Service did, took a, a, undertook a massive law enforcement effort to crack down on an industry that was killing our wildlife half a million birds a year. Today, the same level of, 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 of wildlife mortality, crickets. The wind industry has been given effectively a free pass when it comes to the enforcement of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, even though it's our second oldest wildlife protection law. Bats don't have as good a PR as, as birds. They are, they are important pollinators and insectivores, and wind turbines are taking a massive toll on bats. Why do we care about them? Because there are only flying mammals. They're important insectivores and pollinators. But they're a key part of the ecosystem. And they reproduce very slowly. And yet this isn't being discussed at all. Nothing. Instead, the Biden administration, Joe Biden said, we need to build tens of thousands more wind turbines. Well, what about the wildlife? The wildlife that belongs to, you know, all of us? Oh, well, you know, climate change. OK, well, climate change, fine. Climate change is a concern. It's not the only concern. Um, natural gas power burn, this is just a quick slide. My first book was on Enron, came out in 2002. When Enron went bankrupt, we were burning about five trillion cubic feet of gas per year in the electric sector. We've now doubled that number. Our electric grid and our electric grid have merged. It was one of the reasons why we had blackouts in Texas. Just in time delivery of natural gas, and pro-natural gas, but it, the, the power plants that use natural gas depend on it being delivered just in time. Can't pile it up like you can coal, can't store it like you can uranium, can't put it in a big old tank like you do diesel fuel. So our grid has become far more dependent on natural gas. That, when, when the weather is fair and we have lots of gas and there's no problem, it's not a problem. But during crunch time, when it gets cold or super hot, it can be a real problem. This is data, I just put this slide together the other day. This is DOE data looking at the number of grid interruptions, that's their term, the major disturbances and unusual occurrences, that's the DOE's term. What we're seeing is, excuse me, more, um, more blackouts. This is a graph showing blackouts across the United States over the last 20 years. And I'm no data scientist, but I, it, the numbers are going up. In fact, they're 10x what they were in, in, in 2020, they were 10x what they were in 2000. Which leads to my next slide. What's good for Generac is bad for America. Familiar with Generac, based in, in Wisconsin, Waukesha, right? A publicly traded company, the stock is on fire. Why? Because everybody around the country wants a generator. I just got one at our house. And what is the, and look at the, 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 the line on increasing use of renewables leading to variability of supply and grid instability. That's a screenshot from Generac's latest investor report. You can look on their website. None of this is my data. These are all screenshots from Generac's latest investment, uh, their latest investor presentation. And look at where they they're, think they're, their biggest markets are. <laughs> California and Texas. Gee, imagine that. So yeah, great for Generac. I'm not opposed to the company. But the, every dollar that's invested in a Generac generator is a dollar that doesn't go to put your grandkid through college or buy a new car or dishwasher or something else because people are concerned about the grid failing them for good reason. And why is Generac saying the grid is less stable? 
because of renewables. Why would they say that in their investor presentation if it wasn't true? Um, I'm repeating uh, just a slide that, that Isaac presented just a moment ago. This is from the International Energy Agency report in May. Um, offshore wind, look at the, the material inputs. The fundamental issue is the lower the power density, the higher the resource intensity. When you, when you have a low power density system, whether it's corn ethanol, solar, wind, you have to put more stuff in, more concrete, more steel, more manganese, cobalt, all of these other things to overcome the low power density. Well, okay, so Isaac went over this slide, I won't stay here, but where do all these critical minerals come from? This is the same data, another screenshot from the IEA's report in May. China, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not here, I'm no foreign policy expert, China is not our friend. And the idea that we're gonna, uh, the Biden administration just yesterday asked OPEC to produce more oil, so what are we now, we're gonna go ask the Chinese, oh, produce some more rare earths because we want more wind turbines? Are you serious? I mean, truly, I mean, it's staggering. And I'm, I know I'm getting all wound up here, but I'm, the, 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 the blackouts in, in February changed my view on these issues. I knew the numbers, I knew the, 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 the policy, but the blackout brought it home, into my house home. And the idea that we're gonna suddenly rely more on China for critical minerals and, for, and forego domestic energy production, it's madness. Okay, so what are my bottom lines? Uh, we got to stop fragilizing the grid. What's the fragilization of the grid? What is the fatal trifecta? That's uh, Meredith Angwin's line, a woman I quite admire. She just published a great book called Shorting the Grid. I've had her on my podcast three times. Marvelous, intelligent woman in her, in her late 70s who's producing just incredibly uh, 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 insightful work on, the, on the, the fragilization of our grid. Her line is the fatal trifecta. What is the fatal trifecta? Increased reliance on imports, increased reliance on renewables, and increased reliance on just-in-time natural gas. That's exactly what's happening all across the country with the grid in the United States. It, is a, it can be a fatal trifecta. I'll let you read the other ones. Affordability, resilience, and supply chains, those are the themes that I, I put forward. I, I testified before the House, uh, House uh, subcommittee on June 30th talking about electric vehicles. But those same issues apply to the grid, affordability, resilience, and supply chains. And we, we need to enforce uh, 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 noise limits and protect human health. Where's the precautionary principle when it comes to noise and wind turbines? It's been thrown out the window. Why? Because the corporations that are pushing these projects are very powerful. They have a very powerful lobby in Washington, and they are getting their way. And they are riding roughshod over rural communities across this country. Uh, this is the advertising portion of the program. This is my film. Um, John kindly mentioned it. I'm very proud of this movie. Uh, it's the best film, best documentary you'll see on electricity you'll ever see. <laughs> Dizzy Dean said, if you can back it up, it ain't bragging. There you are. You can watch it free on the Roku channel, uh, on all the other streaming platforms. Whoops. I've written six books. Tell your friends, tell your neighbors. You don't have to read them. You just have to buy them. And if you buy it on your Kindle, I make a better royalty. Uh, tune into my podcast. The latest one features none other than Isaac Orr from here at the Center of the American Experiment. Uh, I have a great time on the podcast. I've really been uh, fortunate. I had great guests, Bjorn Lomborg, Michael Schellenberger, uh, Matt Ridley, Dan Jurgen. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to continue talking about these issues because I am passionate about them. And Minnesota is a key player in these issues. And I wish... Uh, you all the best in your efforts to bring more uh, sanity and rationality to the energy discussion and particularly the electric grid because the grid is the mother network. It is the network upon which our entire society depends. And what we're seeing are our forces, our, our uh, economic interests, political interests that are fragilizing the grid with no concern for the future, no concern for resilience, no concern for reliability. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much.